Welcome everyone. I hope you're all safe and well in this difficult time. Thank you for joining us today for a very special event. My name is Claire Halloran and I'm the Vice President of the Oxford Climate Society and a postgraduate student at Oxford. The Oxford Climate Society is a student society at the University of Oxford that aims to develop the next generation of informed climate leaders. In addition to our speaker events, we run educational programs throughout the year, including our award-winning School of Climate Change, which taught over 1,500 people from all over the world last term. We also run the world's largest student-run climate journal, Anthroposphere, and are currently working with the university to develop net zero policies and incorporate climate action into the Oxford curriculum. The theme of today's event is the environmental impacts of our digital lives. As we transition, sorry, just a moment, there's a technical issue. Sorry, as I was saying, the theme of today's event is the environmental impact of our digital lives. As we transition to increasingly digital lives, we need to be aware of the systems which support us and their environmental impacts. The COVID crisis over the past year has moved many people li people's lives online, from virtual meetings to streaming binges in lockdown. According to the BBC, Zoom had more than 300 million daily users at its peak last year, and Netflix had a record 200 million total subscribers in 2020, according to The Guardian. This digital migration reinforces a broader trend toward increased use of the cloud and its associated data centers for storing documents, photos, and email through photos like Google Drive, iCloud, and Yahoo Mail. Even before the pandemic, the International Data Corporation estimated that the global data sphere will grow from 33 zettabytes in 2018 to 175 zettabytes in 2025, and much of this data will be stored in data centers. Even though it doesn't end up on our electricity bill, data centers still use energy for all of these activities. Energy which, according to researchers at Northwestern University, the University of California, accounts for 1% of global electricity use in 2020. Moreover, many of our devices rely on minerals such as lithium and cobalt, that are mined in politically sensitive context by socioeconomically vulnerable workers, often in the global south. As we transition to increasingly digital lives, we need to gain awareness about the systems which support and enable our work, leisure, and daily routines and their environmental impacts. To learn more about these impacts, I am delighted to be joined by two experts on the topic, Professor Mike Hazas and George Kamaya. Professor Mike Hazas is a professor at Uppsala University in Information Technology, whose research focuses on the invisible energy and carbon impact of online services like social networking and gaming. Mike has spent over 15 years researching digital technologies and sustainability at Lancaster University and Uppsala University. George Kamaya is a digital and energy analyst at the IEA who leads their analysis of information and communication technology energy use, as well as automated and shared mobility. He has authored several pieces on the energy use of data centers, as well as the impact of big tech on clean energy transitions. We're going to start this event with each of the speakers giving a short speech on their thoughts on the topic, followed by questions from myself before opening it to questions from the audience on, at the end. If you have any questions for our speakers, please write them in the live stream chat on the right hand side on YouTube. Mike and George, thank you so much for joining us today. Mike, I'll hand the floor over to you to start. Great, uh, thanks very much. I'm just gonna uh, get set up here. Um, okay, um, I guess that's probably coming across okay now. Um, <clears throat> So yes, uh, thanks a lot for for um, inviting me to speak. It's a it's a, it's a pleasure to 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 be here virtually. Um, just a, a quick uh, advisory: um, uh, some of the some of the figures on these slides um, are a little out of date. Uh, things go out of date really fast in this in this field. Um, so um, in in a few places, I'll I'll point out 
uh, where 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 things are just just um, a little bit revised or whatever. But it doesn't doesn't really affect the the overall message. And in any case, I'll I'll, I'll defer to uh, George on to give us the the collections of of some of the latest numbers. Um, so it's a great uh, it's great to be followed by 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 that. Um, so yeah, so I guess I just wanted to uh, start out um, by um, oops, sorry, that's not um, all right. Hang on a second. Sorry about that. Is that working again? Good. Um, uh, by by just kind of getting to think a little bit about sort of what happens towards the uh, the end of of, of your day, um, and and so you know I guess you might um, sort of head. Um, you know, home, uh, maybe maybe on public transportation, um, where many people might check social media or, or read the news uh, on their phone. Um, or if you're in a car, you might might listen to uh, FM or AM radio, but increasingly we can listen uh, through, through streaming services like my Spotify. Um, uh, many people find ways to fit exercise into their evening, uh, and this can be accompanied by listening to music, uh, possibly also using a fitness tracker app uh, on a smartphone. Uh, and then uh, sort of heading home for, for dinner, you might sort of look up a recipe online, uh, send messages to friends or family uh, while you're waiting, uh, sometimes just, just to say that, that you've gotten home. Uh, then after eating and, and, and clearing up, uh, you might uh, sort of watch something in the evening, uh, perhaps together with other people. Uh, and again, this might be using uh, broadcast television, uh, but increasingly it's through streaming services like Netflix, Amazon Prime, or, or Hulu. Finally, as, as the evening uh, sort of wears on, you might head towards bed, uh, do some reading or, or watch something else before, before falling asleep. Um, so you can probably see a pattern uh, emerging here uh, in a very frequent use of, of digital uh, devices and, and online services. So, so if any of this looks familiar, you're certainly not alone. Um, and myself and colleagues have been assembling the evidence on why this matters um, some, and looking at some of the ways that these services have worked their way uh, into our everyday lives uh, and, and, and what we can do about it. So why does this matter? Um, it matters for two reasons. Uh, the first is that digital stuff actually has a, has a big footprint. And you, know, you can look at footprint in, in different ways. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's about one-tenth, maybe closer to perhaps 9%, of global electricity, that's all of, of information technologies, the data centers, the devices, um, everything. Um, you could also look at footprint uh, in terms of the carbon emissions, uh, and that's maybe around 3% of carbon emissions globally, uh, similar to the airline industry. That's a, a um, comparison that's often made. Um, and, and so that's kind, of, that's kind of where we're at there. The second reason that this matters is that the footprint is actually growing fast. Um, so often cited are, are traffic volumes. Uh, so uh, mobile phone data traffic has been doubling every two to three years or so, uh, which, is, which is exponential, obviously. Um, and we're also seeing uh, strong growth for, for broadband and, and business traffic. So for example, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, the average household broadband went from 17 gigabytes per month to more than 100 gigabytes per month in a little over five years. That's, that's per household. Um, and as a result, the overall electricity to power all this stuff um, is set to go from the current share of about eight or 9% of, of global electricity um, to around 18% by 2030. So this graph shows the older estimates from, from a 2015 paper, which I've got right here in the corner, but, but those kind of have been shifted down just a little bit. But regardless, IT's energy is, is expected to double uh, potentially in a little over of a, de of a decade. Um, so if we go back to the comparison with the airline industry, which receives a lot of attention uh, and a debate, should we expand this airport? What effect will this have on emissions targets? So if the airline industry were to double or more by 2030, wouldn't that be framed as a potential problem uh, and something uh, that we should, we should actively um, debate? So it's, it's exactly that sort of problem that we have for information technology. Um, in order to understand that problem um, for digital stuff, you can look, uh, for example, at what the energy goes into, uh, and again, the slices of these of these uh, pieces of the pie uh, uh, do change uh, year to year. But there's there's some power that goes into the devices themselves. This is in the home, the workplace, laptops, televisions, mobile phone chargers. Uh, then we need to run the data centers, um, uh, and then we have to run the Wi-Fi, the broadband, the cellular networks, and the the, the fiber backbone of the internet. 
And, and of course, don't forget that we actually need to build all that stuff in the first place uh, and, and, and ship it to where it needs to be. Um, so I guess a, a one rule of thumb is that if you flip on your television to watch Netflix, uh, maybe about half the energy uh, goes into the TV directly and, and around half of it goes into running Netflix over the, over the network and, and in, the, in the content distribution uh, servers. But perhaps more useful for discussion and debate, and this is something that, that I prefer, um, is, is thinking about what is the internet actually for? What's it accomplishing for us? What are all these services actually doing? Uh, so you can look at things like uh, so at traffic, so the amount of internet traffic globally, um, at least half of that is audio and video streaming. Um, I would say it's probably nearing 60, 70%, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, and certainly YouTube and Netflix are, are leaders there. Um, around 15% or so is social networking and all the associated advertisements uh, like you get from, from Facebook and Twitter. Uh, maybe 10% is actually automated traffic, such as app updates and downloads and photo backups to the cloud and things like that. And the rest is everything else you might think of, web browsing, email, online gaming, things like that. Um, so I've been sort of looking at the role of all this internet traffic uh, in people's everyday lives and sort of what meaning it holds for them. Uh, and, and there are some key observations that I'd like to share. Um, so many times uh, we might actually be watching a video uh, and it's um, uh, sort of, you know, it's on the screen or it's, it's on the phone in front of us, uh, but actually video is, is used a lot to just provide some background noise. This is while we're cooking, eating, talking, or simply lounging. Uh, it's similar to how we might've left a TV or a radio on in the background in the past, uh, except it's much easier to do now because many devices uh, stream and it's as easy as pulling your phone out of your pocket potentially and opening an app. Um, devices are often used uh, to fill time. Uh, so typical examples are while waiting for a bus or a train, maybe trying to get to sleep or trying to get back to sleep, uh, or perhaps just, just being a bit bored and trying to pass the time. So this comes amidst observations, which you might have seen the news about how much time we now spend on mobile devices, three hours or more per day in, in North America and, and Europe. Uh, but on the positive side, I'd like to uh, point out that these devices really do have important value and meaning in our lives. Uh, it's not just for entertainment like watching TV or cat videos on YouTube. It's, a, it's the interaction between people that counts. So talking with each other, sharing moments and feelings through words and pictures. So what can we, we do about all this? Well, I suppose there's another number of things you can keep in mind uh, for your own household. Uh, one is that um, uh, Wi-Fi routers, uh, pretty much one, at least in every household, uh, can consume quite a lot of energy in the home relative to other digital things. They don't consume a lot, maybe five to eight watts, but they consume all the time. So it adds up in that way. Um, so if you're going to be gone from home for a few weeks or even a few days, you might just consider switching, switching off the, 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 the Wi-Fi networking, just as you would other appliances or indeed lights. In a similar vein, try to stay mindful of stuff uh, that's on in the background. Is this something you're actively paying attention to? Is it is it something that's giving you value, or is it is it really just just noise? Uh, and in fact, you might have noticed that that many devices now rely on on digital services by default. So you could kind of reflect on whether is this actually the most convenient or interesting or fun way to get the content. Is that program actually worthwhile compared to others you might be able to access? Um, so think about sort of, you know, when you're, when you're making purchases as well, particularly those that rely on a specific digital service and assume that the network's always there. Does it, does it always default to the highest audio and video resolution? What happens when, when the Wi-Fi network in your home gets busy? What happens, you know, when you take it on vacation with you and it, and it maybe doesn't have a network? So, so these are just, just some small things that, that households can do. But, but I think at scale, there's, there's certainly things that uh, technology designers and researchers um, can do, uh, and, and, and certainly big companies have, have a responsibility cons to consider. Um, so right now, uh, these, all these services are ostensibly for free, or, or, or they have all-you-can-eat plans associated with them. You can watch as much video or, or download as much, as much data, do as much browsing as you like. Thus, this gives the impression that data traffic is for free somehow and without limit. So we can do a lot more to kind of properly expose the energy and environmental footprint of these services rather than it just being kind of invisible or hidden. So you could envision, you know, maybe app stores that show ratings for different services based on how much they rely on the internet or, or, or data centers. Or similarly, you might have a video selection screen uh, on a streaming service which, which shows 
you know, what, what you can watch, the, the list of films, but then that might come with an environmental rating based on the, the data traffic that would be generated. Um, so this is the kind of thing we already see for appliances like refrigerators. Um, and for several years, uh, Greenpeace uh, has published a report series called Clicking Clean, which provides ratings for some of the big companies. So that's, that's worth checking out. Um, I'd also like to, to kind of point out that, that right now there's all this stuff that happens in the background. So a lot of people are familiar with the experience of picking up their phone and then seeing a, a bunch of notifications. Um, so so, so this, this all is kind of happening in the background regardless of what we're doing. Um, but devices and apps often know when they're not being actively used. So most notably when the screen is off. Um, so perhaps the default should be that, that no data or very little data actually moves during these times. Um, and a nice side effect of that might be that the lack of notifications would be appreciated by those who try to minimize disruption and interruptions um, and strive for some level of, of digital detox. Um, so I, I think all of this is kind of part of, 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 uh, of a phenomenon where even technology designers themselves forget that data traffic has a footprint. So, so you know, we, can, we could sort of seek to minimize the number of application software updates. And you know, we, could, we could look for ways to, to support meaningful communication, um, you know, even, even SMS or instant messaging, um, instead of sort of more fully featured um, you know, kind of social, social networking with, with all the adverts and, and video feeds that come with them. So th those are some of the things that, that uh, technologies uh, designers and, 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 and companies might be able to do. But I think there's, there's something that all of us together as a society can do. Uh, we need to make energy part of the debate. So we do, do this with other large scale infrastructures uh, and public services. We debate the impacts of building roads uh, and expanding airports, um, of, of healthcare and, and how best to provide that. And even things like regulations for heating and cooling and how those, how those affect uh, carbon emissions of, of, of new and, and, and converted buildings. So why don't we do all this for, for online services? A lot of times the, the politics around the planning of data centers or high-speed broadband is focused on local jobs or, or access to, uh, to, to services for rural areas. And, and both of these are, are important, but, but we should also consider the footprint. So for example, if, if a decision is taken to allow a new data center or to deploy 5G in a given area, we might mandate that renewables uh, be built alongside that to, 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 supply, to supply the new infrastructure. And more broadly, we should be thinking about what real value these services provide to society and whether this actually justifies the footprint. Um, so we're, we're, you know, as, as you know, sort of large societies, we, we are in control of how these things can develop. Um, they needn't continue on their current path of unquestioned growth. Um, so, so we just need to, to make energy part of the debates uh, about digital devices and infrastructures. Um, I, I have some, uh, just a few uh, concluding thoughts um, of uh, just, which maybe just might help the discussion uh, in a little while. And then uh, before handing off, um, I talked a lot about raising awareness and this is really important uh, because it, it sort of, um, it gives us um, a kind of an ongoing um, uh, uh, sort of feel for, for, for you know, sort of energy uh, or, or environmental impact of, of digital services. But it, it's, this is not actually to place responsibility for change on the individual. We can't just stop using digital stuff. Um, you know, we can reduce a little bit, but, but large change isn't gonna come through individual action. It needs to happen through a government and, and corporate policy. Um, and a, um, a second uh, point uh, that, that um, keeps coming up for me is that is automated traffic. So I mentioned app updates uh, and photo backups uh, to the cloud as examples, but there are a lot of emerging classes uh, of automated traffic, machines talking to machines, security cameras, AI, self-driving cars, uh, and things like that. And a lot of that traffic is actually secret or happens between, between, uh, between companies or is, is very difficult to measure. Um, so, so that's kind of a potential area for growth. Uh, and finally, uh, sort of gaming and game streaming services like uh, Google Stadia and NVIDIA GeForce Now are also growing fast. So games are increasingly high fidelity and 4K game streaming um, sort of basically from, from cloud, cloud servers is, is, is already an option. Uh, and so taking this alongside uh, 4K video streaming could, could mean sort of you know, huge growth for, for, uh, for data traffic in the future. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. George, I'd love to hear what you've prepared for us today. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Claire. And uh, yeah, that was, that was a great uh, introduction to the, the topic, uh, Mike. Thanks for that. Um, so I'll try to kind of dive into some of the numbers around specific applications, but also kind of frame this question around um, how digitalization has both a direct footprint and then kind of an indirect effect on other sectors. So uh, first, I guess, uh, for context, uh, most global greenhouse gas emissions right now come from the energy system, energy and industrial processes. Uh, you know, these sources of emissions come from many different sectors and subsectors. So power generation industry, uh, buildings, transportation, all the, the, all the types of modes. So uh, ICT digital technologies is, is just one part of this. Uh, so there's a direct footprint associated with data centers, data transmission networks, uh, devices, uh, but also those technologies have uh, effects on other sectors. So if you think about, you know, your smartphone having GPS, that has enabled uh, a new business model for uh, ride, ride hailing like Uber. So that has impacts on emissions and energy in, in transportation, which have kind of secondary effects on, you know, how we make infrastructure decisions around uh, a modal choice or parking or uh, the design of cities. So we need to think about these different layers of effects when we're talking about uh, such as general purpose technology like um, ICT. So first on the digital footprint, um, direct footprint, um, you know, compared to most other energy and uh, economic indicators, uh, if you take population, GDP, electricity use, uh, the, the growth in ICT and digital technologies is, is just uh, kind of on a different scale. So the number of internet users between uh, over the past two decades has grown by about 10 times. Uh, internet traffic is up 2,000 times. So, you know, naturally, there's this um, expectation or assumption that uh, because demand is growing so rapidly that there is going to be a, um, you know, a, an equivalent growth in energy demand and emissions. So uh, here's a headline from Forbes in 1999. Uh, saying that uh, because, uh, you know, uh, projecting that half the electric grid in the U.S. was going to be powering the internet economy uh, within the next decade. Uh, clearly, that didn't happen. What has happened, at least in the data center uh, energy use area, is that uh, despite huge growth in internet traffic, so the chart on the left shows uh, internet traffic growing about 12 times between 2010 and 2019, uh, demand, so data center workloads growing about seven and a half times, data center energy use was uh, relatively flat. And this is about 200 terawatt hours of electricity a year right now, uh, which is about 1% of global electricity use. Uh, so there's two main factors that have gone into how, you know, the, the demand has decoupled from energy uh, demand. So one is this huge shift from uh, less efficient traditional data centers to cloud and hyperscale data centers, which you can see on the right. Uh, the other is a huge energy efficiency improvement trends just at the computing level and at the data transmission level. So um, the so-called Kumi's law, which is kind of the energy equivalent of Moore's law showing, you know, every two to three years, uh, compute efficiency doubling. Similarly, we see a trend in uh, data transmission networks where energy efficiency of uh, data transmission has been doubling every two to three years uh, in some uh, economies. Uh, so there's a lot of effort put into reducing energy, uh, energy use overall through uh, energy efficiency improvements, but also uh, these companies are also uh, heavily investing into renewable energy. So as, as Mike mentioned, you know, why, why not supply that electricity uh, that's uh, demanded with renewables? So um, they've accounted for about half of global uh, corporate renewable purchase, uh, power purchase agreements over the past few years. Um, and increasingly more companies are committing to 100% renewable energy targets. Uh, some have already reached that, uh, but it's important to, to kind of caveat that and say, you know, for example, Google has reached 100% renewables. That just means that they're purchasing enough renewables uh, each year to match the uh, demand that their data centers are having. So it doesn't mean that every electron that's going into each of their data centers is clean. Uh, they are striving to also decarbonize on a 24-7 basis, which I think is very interesting because, you know, there's some flexibility and load around data centers. So conceivably, you could try to shift workloads across time and space to try to match uh, your demand for data center services to uh, clean electricity. Uh, you know, I've just focused on the use phase uh, right now, but, um, you know, there are environmental impacts throughout the product life cycle. So, uh, as Mike mentioned, you know, there's raw materials that go into these products, uh, manufacturing that's quite energy intensive. They're distributed across the world. And at the end of life, uh, they have to be recycled or disposed of. 
Generally, um, the smaller the device, the more important the raw materials and manufacturing stage. So if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that the embodied emissions, which is the kind of the um, upstream, I guess, before it gets to the user, is very high for uh, smartphones relative to the, the use phase because most of these battery powered electronics are very efficient uh, because that's what the consumer is demanding. And obviously the, the form factor is very small. Uh, so you know, just to say we need to think about both the use phase and, and the life cycle as well. So where are we headed? Um, there's been headlines like this um, saying that, you know, data, uh, the internet could consume a fifth of global electricity in the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, you know, lots of, uh, many of these headlines kind of rely on this 2015 study that uh, Mike referenced um, <clears throat> that uh, had a kind of a worst case scenario, uh, an expected case and a best case. So this, this bar shows, uh, this wedge shows uh, the, the, the range there. A lot of the media headlines tend to like to quote this very extreme number, which has, you know, is unlikely to happen. Um, the study author acknowledges that himself. Uh, and it's important to note that since that 2015 study, he's actually updated his analysis uh, several times uh, as recently as last year, where the numbers are actually much, much lower. So uh, it just goes to show how rapidly the, the changes are in the sector. Uh, that assumptions from five, six years ago can uh, can very quickly come out of date um, and result in uh, overestimates in the future. Uh, but you know, generally, uh, I I would caution any prediction projections that go out that far because you know if we think back ten years, uh, we've seen three G, four G, smartphones, new applications like uh, streaming video. But then on the kind of reduction side, we've seen uh, huge efficiency uh, gains, electricity decarbonization. Now we're kind of at the, the cusp of these new technologies like blockchain, machine learning, uh, 5G, augmented reality. And it's very difficult to try to project how these technologies are gonna evolve, what kind of applications are built on top of those, how people are gonna use them. And um, you know, the, this kind of battle between growing demand and uh, efficiency improvements uh, over the next couple of decades. So it's, it's an incredibly difficult sector to project compared to every other uh, demand sector in energy. Uh, now, going into the specifics of uh, uh, streaming video, uh, you might have seen a headline like this saying, uh, you know, a half hour show of, of streaming video emits 1.6 kilograms of CO2, which seemed really high. Uh, so I did a fact check, um, and then my numbers were about 40 to 80 times lower. Of course, that depends on, you know, what grid you're relying on. If you're in the UK, it's going to be slightly lower than the global average, and France, uh, where I, I live, much lower. Uh, and of course, that's kind of you know, depends what you're comparing it to, right? So is that compared to uh, going to the theater uh, to watch a movie or is it compared to renting a DVD or is it compared to uh, watching broadcast television? So, but generally the, the carbon footprint of streaming based on the, the latest data is, is quite low. Um, so if you look at the electricity use side of things, uh, here are some other estimates that have been published uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, so the shift project was the, the one that was widely quoted. Uh, there was a paper published earlier this year by uh, Renee Obringer et al., um, kind of looking at um, you know streaming video, uh, web conferencing, things like that. Um, I guess I'd like to highlight a couple issues that I see with uh, many of these studies uh, that I've, I've I've learned about. So one is uh, I think I've already mentioned this, but using uh, older assumptions. So I, I showed the chart showing how uh, data transmission is, for example, has been doubling every two to, uh, efficiency has been doubling every two three years. So using an uh, intensity assumption from five or six years ago can greatly overestimate energy use. Uh, the second is that uh, I think is this assumption that data is proportional to energy. So you might hear things like, uh, you know, if you cut uh, your uh, streaming resolution from HD to SD, uh, which reduces your bit rate by, uh, by four times, uh, you're gonna reduce your energy cost. But in fact, most internet infrastructure is not built that way. Uh, of course, long-term planning, relies on that kind of peak demand of, of data, but uh, just because you have or double your, your um, data doesn't mean it's gonna translate into the equivalent energy consumption. So those kind of errors result in these kind of, um, you know, headlines that say, you know, if you turn all your video off, you can suddenly save carbon emissions by 96%, which, you know, on a, on a data basis might be true, but on a carbon and emission, uh, energy basis for the internet infrastructure, that's actually not true. Uh, so that study, uh, Renee Oberger showed, uh, you know, HD consuming four times as much uh, energy than SD, uh, but in reality, it's, you know, maybe a 1% difference. That same paper looked at how 
increased uh, data traffic during COVID-19 would result in increased energy use. So they were saying that it would increase uh, internet related uh, energy use by 43 um, terawatt hours. Um, but in reality, you know, if you look at the, the data that's coming up from network operators, uh, for example, Telefonica, one of the biggest network operators in the world, traffic was up 45% last year, uh, but energy use was actually down uh, slightly over 1%. Uh, the other is that limited scope. Some uh, studies exclude different types of the system, either uh, devices or the life cycle emissions, uh, often leading to an underestimate. So you can see in these kind of red shadings where they didn't uh, account for um, devices, which actually is a, is a big part of the equation, uh, or they you know, assume that most of the watching is, is done on small devices, which tend to consume very little electricity. Uh, so overall here, are my kind of my numbers, Basically, the, the message is that uh, the electricity consumption is, is fairly small. Most of it is actually coming from the device, uh, especially if you're you know, watching on a large television, which consumes you know, 100 times more electricity than your smartphone. So um, at the user level, the, the biggest thing you could do is if you wanted to reduce your energy impact is to watch on a smaller device, or if you're watching on a television, to, to share that uh, watching experience with uh, many other people. Um, the other is this kind of lack of context or counterfactual. Um, so I've already mentioned this, but there was a headline a couple of years ago in, in stream, uh, Rolling Stone, you know, saying uh, how dangerous is streaming video to the environment? Um, but, you know, again, the question is compared to what? So uh, in the case of streaming music, um, you know, it's, it's probably much more efficient to listen to Spotify on my smartphone than to turn on a, a speaker system or a CD player, which might consume 10 to 15 watts versus a, a smartphone, which is consuming one watt with the screen on and probably less with the screen off. Uh, of course, you know, if you think about the, the travel required to go buy a CD uh, or a record, uh, the, the shipping costs of that, the manufacturing the plastic, uh, these are things we need to think about when we, when we talk about the, the counterfactuals of these statements. Uh, similarly, there's been kind of statements around email use um, saying, you know, this is an environmental problem. Uh, but, you know, for example, you know, that, that analysis relied on this, you know, one gram per email uh, number from a few years ago, I think 10 years ago, actually. Uh, but if you extrapolate that, it, you know, it's like 0.5% of global energy GHGs, which is very high, considering email only counts for 1% of web traffic. So there are very easy ways to kind of very quickly fact check, you know, are these numbers realistic? Uh, where are they coming from? Um, and you, if you look at the electricity use of that streaming video claim, you know, if it's, if it's costing six kilowatt hours of electricity per hour and somebody's paying for that electricity, who is paying one pound per hour uh, for that video? Uh, here's another one, which you know said 380 something uh, kilowatt hours per 35 hours of video, which works up to 11 kilowatts of electricity. It just doesn't make any sense that you would be consuming the equivalent of 100 big screen TVs uh, for a streaming video. So I think the, the media has some responsibility to play in kind of fact checking these, uh, these, these numbers before kind of um, creating a kind of alarmist headlines. Um, kind of stepping back, I think one thing I'd like to highlight is that if we focus too much on these kind of small impact um, activities, I, I worry that uh, we're distracting from, you know, we need transformational change to meet our climate change targets and, and reach net zero by mid-century. Um, you know, each citizen, you know, only has a finite number, uh, amount of attention and, and political, I guess, you know, as a politician or, you know, policymaker, you have a, a finite set of political capital, I guess, to, to convince consumers to reduce their footprint. Of course, there's a lot to do uh, for, for companies and governments as well. But I'm I'm personally not convinced this is the, the right one. You know, there's uh, the the big impacts at the personal level. I think are, are transportation, diet, these kind of things where you could actually have massive uh, behavior change to reduce emissions. And I'm not convinced that you know, for example, the uh, you know streaming in low low definition, which is an Earth Day campaign. I'm not convinced this is the really the the right way to be approaching uh, consumer uh, responsibility. I think now stepping back even further, there's a lot that digital technologies have uh, in terms of effects on other sectors. Uh, so if we think about you know, teleworking, the, the, the impacts from ICT are actually quite small, both positive and negative. The major impacts are gonna come from increased residential energy use and decreased commuting energy use. And those do really depend on the country you're in, the types of commuting patterns, uh, the types of fuels you have in your home. And critically, I think longer term, 
if we are teleworking in a more permanent basis, there's a risk that we, you know, of urban sprawl, uh, people moving outside of cities into larger homes. And we need to think about, you know, how these uh, technologies impact uh, transportation buildings and, and those things. Similarly for e-commerce, the ICT impact is very small. It's really a battle between, you know, uh, the, the transportation of the customer versus last mile delivery, and then kind of brick and mortar stores versus warehouses. Of course, there's kind of behavioral effects, you know, does the ease of purchasing online make it, you know, are, are people purchasing more? But on the other side, does this mean we can connect, you know, resale and reuse of, of, uh, of materials? Uh, a couple of years ago, we published a major report on applying digital technologies in the energy system. Uh, we looked across the energy system in terms of, you know, how you use IoT, machine learning to improve efficiency, uh, reduce emissions. The main message I would like to say from this is that uh, not all applications of digital, digital technologies are going to be net positive for climate. Uh, if you think about automated cars, there's a risk that, you know, if, of course, if they're shared and automated and electrified, you could potentially reduce emissions. But if they're just privately owned automated cars that are uh, running on internal combustion engines, that's just going to increase emissions similarly with oil and gas or extending the lifetime of coal plants. Uh, so that's where I'll, I'll, I'll close it. Um, but generally, um, I think it's important that we all kind of uh, pay attention to, to the to how we have impacts on the environment in terms of our digital uh, footprint, uh, but also thinking about you know, the, the broader structural changes as Mike highlight, uh, highlighted, both at the company level uh, and at the government level. And I've included a, a list of other readings that could be interesting. All right, thank you so much. Both of you really um, covered a wide variety of topics and that was really interesting. Um, the first question I have is the technology space in particular is really dominated by these huge powerful countries. I know in my home country of the US, progressive politicians are calling to break up these monopolies because they're so powerful. Um, how do you think that these large technology companies could help or hinder climate mitigation? I'm sorry, George, we can't hear you. Could you start from the beginning of your answer? Oh, sorry. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so I think, you know, I showed in that chart showing how ICT companies over the past few years have been accounting for about half of global uh, corporate renewable purchasing agreements. So I think they're doing a lot kind of in terms of direct action. Uh, some companies are, are looking further into their supply chain, which I think is, is, is very positive. Um, so, you know, especially if you're a device manufacturing company like Apple, uh, it's very, you know, the bulk of your emissions are actually coming from uh, upstream. So uh, emissions that you don't directly control, but you could influence. Um, so I think that's uh, quite important. It, it broadly, um, I mean, they're, they have so much, I guess, technological, uh, uh, you know, advanced technologies that I, I'm I would like them to see uh, to to use more of their technology. So, you know, for example, if you think of Google, who owns DeepMind, or Amazon, who has very advanced uh, machine learning, Microsoft, similarly with their Azure, uh, these technologies could be used. You know, I mentioned in that slide around um, how digital technologies could impact the energy system. You could use machine learning to better predict uh, in real time. Um, you know, for example, the solar and wind availability. You could, you know, um, use machine learning to match that uh, increased uh, availability of clean electricity with demand sources um, like uh, electric vehicles. Um, so there, there are ways we could use be using these advanced digital technologies, and it would be nice to have these companies play a bigger role in that um, in that space. I think um, so. Yeah, it's to me, it's it's a bit. You know, there's a lot of focus put on the direct footprint of, you know, these data centers, which I think is, you know, is, is, is fine. Uh, we should be reducing that energy use and reducing those emissions. But I think we're missing the big picture if we don't think about how these technologies are used. So both in, in the positive and negative ways, because uh, not all uses, like I mentioned, are, are going to be uh, net uh, emission saving. 
uh, some could could actually uh, make things much, much worse. Mike? Uh, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, I, I think um, um, it's it's a really tricky problem because for a lot of these large uh, companies, um, the there is an interest in keeping the user engaged because there's kind of um, basically um, sort of advertising fees and things like that. So so that's why we have autoplay of advertisements, autoplay of the next video, the video feed of, at the side of the social networking scroll. That's why the scroll is infinite, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I think, I think, you know, sort of, you know, looking for ways to, um, you know, to, you know, to, I guess, maybe keep some of that engagement, but, but with less data. I mean, some, some of them are already, you know, doing a lot to try to optimize. So YouTube is really good at sort of delivering just the resolution that, that looks good on that device. Um, so, so they actually, despite them being something like 50% of all video traffic, um, they, for the number of hours watched, it's actually a relatively low, low bit rate and a low, um, low overhead. So, so that's, that's good. But I think there's also things like, you know, like providing, you know, um, really frequent updates to, to applications every week. And there's lots of, lots of little things, uh, that, that, that really, really do add up actually. Um, and I think sort of, you know, a lot of companies will have a sustainability person or a sustainability team, but I think this, you know, that that team needs to be much larger, maybe a sustainability division or something like that, uh, to kind of to kind of look across the organization and, and think more about what they can do and, and what what value is actually being being provided. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. I hope that these companies start to take a bit more responsibility since they're so large. And my next question is, we're obviously going through a huge social shift right now due to COVID, which is why you're both broadcasting from your homes rather than here in Oxford with us. Unfortunately, you can enjoy the pubs. How do you both expect the social changes we're seeing from COVID to affect the energy and climate impact of information and communication technology and their associated social uses? Um, I, I could start. Um, so I think the kind of 2020 data we're seeing um, shows, you know, that even with this very large increase in data traffic, um, some network, many network operators uh, seem to have managed to keep their energy use uh, relatively flat, which is very promising. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to revert back to this, that, that, that graphic I had showing that the effects are actually going to be much larger in the other sectors, right? So, you know, for example, uh, if we're teleworking more, the effects are going to really be in the buildings and in the transportation system, not in the ICT infrastructure. So, um, you know, the the good thing about ICT is that it's highly electrified. So, you know, as electricity grids decarbonize uh, over the next decades, um, and you know, as as corporates you know continue on their uh, renewables power purchasing agreements. Uh, we could bring those emissions down, even if uh, energy use is, is, is flat or, or slightly growing. Um, you know, in aviation, for example, it's much, much tougher uh, because we just don't have at commercial scales the, the technologies that we need to displace uh, the, you know, to, to supply that demand that we have for, for aviation today. So um, I think there's a lot of promise, especially on the energy efficiency side and then renewables. Uh, but, you know, like Mike said, there's a lot yeah, we can do on the behavior side, but really it's so difficult to predict what's going to be happening in, in five or 10 years. You know, we might be doing this conference, uh, this video conference with VR goggles in a couple of years, right? And, you know, I, I don't know how data intensive that is relative to this and, and the, you know, device uh, energy costs of that. So uh, it's just very difficult, but I think generally the impacts are going to be the biggest outside of ICT actually. Uh, so, you know, for example, not having to, to take the train or, or fly to, you know, to, to actually do this call, for example. Yeah, I get this uh, question a lot and, and I'm always, I always come up short. I think the analyses are still, are still being done of, of the effect of, of the pandemic. Um, uh, I think, I think like George was saying, um, you know, particularly on transport, I mean, obviously economic activity is down. So demand will be down, energy is down, emissions are down. So there's a silver lining. Um, but I, I think, you know, when if if people are, you know, for example, in terms of working practices or keeping in touch with family, if people get more comfortable with video calls, that's way better than than driving somewhere or, or even taking the train. 
Um, so, so there are, you know, there, there are potentially, potentially those, those gains outside of IT, as George put it, um, will, will more than make up for any extra traffic. I mean, uh, there, was a, there was an early analysis from Sandvine who kind of aggregate data and do analysis for internet service providers. And so they take a, a sample of that and, and do reports um, that, uh, you know, how much video traffic had gone up, you know, said, if, I think theirs was, it was through April. So fairly early in the pandemic last year. Um, they, I think the report was dated May, um, but basically it, video traffic had gone up, but maybe not as much as you'd expect. And video conferencing went up and, and sort of, and all this kind of stuff, but it was difficult to say that that traffic some of that traffic might have happened had people been going to work. It would have just happened from the workplace and things like that. So it's 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 muddy. I mean, I think one one effect of the pandemic is that people have gotten more comfortable with screens and using screens. So one of the things that keeps coming up in in our field work is that uh, there's a lot of multi-screening going on. Lots of screens on in the same room, streaming stuff at the same time. Uh, usually, there might be a TV streaming something when then there's two people watching the TV. And they've got their phones, maybe streaming something. Um, uh, so, so it's kind of like I think the more kind of lulled into that we get, then there could be kind of that would contribute to the to, to the rise. Um, I mean, it, it helps if not all of those things are in 4K. That's that's good. <laughs> so, um, so I guess smaller smaller screens are, are are better there. So yeah. All right. I appreciate both of your predictions, but we won't hold you to them in a year or two. I guess one other issue that really comes up with internet is this really big gap in internet access between the global north and south. So for example, the World Bank says 90% of individuals in the UK use the internet in 2017 compared to just 19% of individuals in sub-Saharan Africa in 2017. So internet access is really an essential tool for achieving a lot of the sustainable development goals. So thinking about this, how do we manage deployment of information and communication technology to provide people equitable access to the internet without exacerbating the energy and climate impacts, both primary and secondary and larger impacts? I can have a, have a, have a stab at that one. Um, I mean, I, I don't have much direct experience with this myself, um, but there's uh, certainly a whole field, um, some call it, you know, ICT for, for the developing world or, or, or similar, similar names, um, which look at sort of how information technologies are used where in places where infrastructure is more sparse or intermittent or, or otherwise um, sort of outdated uh, by, by the standards of, of, of more developed economies. Um, and, and I think it's, I guess, I guess one of the headlines that always comes out is it's, it's amazing what you can do with the 2G connection. It's actually incredible what you can accomplish. Um, and so a lot of uh, you know, people working with sustainable design of digital technology look, look actually to those contexts for inspiration. Um, and so, so there's kind of a, there's some really interesting lessons to be had there. Um, I'm not an I'm not an expert on the on the particular infrastructures. I mean, often, you know, of course, five G is supposed to be the solution to everything. Um, but I think there is a danger where um, the more you know, the, you know, the more we we connect people, then the more the global traffic goes up, and the more everything gets loaded. Um, but but I think an equitable growth, um, uh, as you know, as of, of course it, everyone should should have access. Um, but you know, doing this in an equitable way, which is sustainable, is kind of kind of a real, a real challenge. And I think we're going to continue to see um, the sort of the, the inequality uh, increase, at least in the short term. It's not there's not a lot of indicators that it's um, it's, it's it's actually decreasing, unfortunately. So it's a it's, it's a real challenge, but I haven't got haven't got the answers to that directly. Yeah, it's a very interesting question uh, because at the IA we also track energy access um, and you know clean cooking access, electricity access, and the the kind of increase in in that access rate has been much much slower actually than uh, internet connectivity in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So, uh, and you actually see how some mobile uh, phone providers are 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 using that as an enabler for electricity access. Uh, because now they can start billing uh, for it um, and, and build out infrastructure. So it's quite interesting. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, all that infrastructure should be built uh, everywhere, uh, right? Like it enables so many things, uh, education, uh, information, 
access, uh, you know, telehealth, all these things that could have very positive uh, benefits for, for these, uh, these people and these economies. So um, I think the, the, I, the energy and emissions problem can be managed, um, you know, like we've been talking about energy efficiency and then also pairing it with renewables. Uh, could be, you know, a way to to manage that. But the I can I think the outsized impact is going to be uh, positive on the, you know, uh, across um, not just energy um, but also in other parts of society in, in these countries. So, uh, to me, it's a no brainer. Um, yeah. Thank you both for your thoughts. So, in my own digital life, I see a lot of people arguing on Twitter about the climate impact of energy intensive blockchain technologies like Bitcoin and non fungible tokens and how these will impact climate change. So just, I guess, as a quick bit of context, the blockchain is sort of an emerging technology. It's a public ledger system where instead of a centralized authority, um, there is decentralized authority and you can verify a lot of these exchanges by doing complex math problems with increasingly specialized computers. And so there's Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and then non-fungible tokens, which have been used a lot in the art world to show ownership. Um, what do you guys think about the climate and energy impact that these technologies can have? I can, I can uh, have, have a start. I think the, um... The, the, I mean, the overall consumption of, of blockchain. And so this is, this, these are systems that use computation as a means for, for getting to the next block. So this, that's the proof of work concept. Uh, there are other ways to do, um, uh, to kind of, to kind of, you know, come up with the next block consensus based and things like that. But, but yeah, a lot of it's proof of work. So that's a lot of computation and, and a lot of demand for, for graphics cards, which means that, that other consumers can't, can't get to them, for example, um, particularly in a pandemic. But I think one of the problems, um, with, with blockchain in particular is, is maybe not so much, it keeps growing and, and it's, you know, it's, it's a sizable percentage, you know, first it's the consumption of Ireland and then it's the consumption of the Netherlands and then it's, you know, it keeps growing. Um, but I think I, the way I like to think of it is what, what is it for? You know, so we, we might say, oh, actually where, you know, I, I fell asleep watching YouTube the other night and it ran for two hours and I feel terrible. And, but, but actually, you know, that, that, that is some consumption, but I mean, that, that maybe you could say that accomplished something potentially, but I, but I'm not sure with, with, um, with, um, uh, sort of the, the, that kind of financial technology, blockchains, I, it's less clear where the value is. Um, obviously, there's values for the investor, uh, but I'm not sure what it's ac actually accomplishing for, for people, for societies uh, in terms of enrichment or anything like that. So, um, so yeah, I think that's the, that's the trick is, is it what's the, what's the value per, per unit of energy that goes into it? That's a, that's, that's a really tough argument to make. At least I've, I've had trouble with it. So. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the, you know, whether it's a useful way to use energy, I think is up to society to determine. Um, so, you know, similarly, we spend money mining gold um, and, and energy and resources, and that's somehow assigned value. Uh, similarly, Bitcoin is, is assigned some kind of value by, you know, these investors. So uh, whether, you know, right now the, the estimates from Cambridge, uh, um, you know, or like I, th I think 130, 140 terawatt hours, which is huge. Um, it's, you know, if, if data centers, uh, every other data center is, is 200 terawatt hours and, and Bitcoin is, is alone 140 terawatt hours, it's, it's, a, it's a sizable uh, um, use of, of electricity. Uh, but, you know, is the, the question, as Mike said, is, is, is it worth it? Uh, what's the value added? Uh, who is benefiting from that? Uh, you know, and, and kind of distributed ledger technologies kind of span not just Bitcoin, and there's a lot of attention folks on Bitcoin because of the price increases. Um, but, you know, there are other ways to, um, to do this, right? So uh, I know Ethereum has been talking a lot about um, proof of stake for a long time. Uh, there are others that work on proof of authority, which are much less energy intensive. So in terms of blockchain applications, there are different ways to do it. Um, and then there's another question of whether blockchain is essential for that application or use case. Uh, in some cases, it might be actually very important to have that um, authentication, transaction history, but in other cases, maybe you could just use existing infrastructure or digital technologies to achieve that same uh, end, time, uh, end 
goal with with uh, even faster transaction speeds. So, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of energy consumption and carbon emissions, I think uh, you know the crypto kind of enthusiasts will say you know it's a kind of it's absorbing a lot of excess renewables. So it's a, it's a very clean way to 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 be using electricity, which I think in the short run seems to be true. And in, in China, uh, a lot of the miners seem to be located in, in kind of renewables rich provinces that are kind of stranded from the, the coastal demand centers. Uh, but I am personally worried that uh, over the longer run, uh, we won't have these uh, stranded uh, renewable assets uh, because they're going to be absorbed by you know excess demand from increasing demand from electric vehicles, other electrifying end uses. So, um, and then my worry is that uh, over the long run, uh, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency mining could become kind of the last, I don't know, last demand source for um, uh, coal-fired power plants that are kind of at end of life. Uh, and would otherwise be uneconomical, but now you you might have a demand for that with uh, with Bitcoin. So um, I'm I'm unsure uh, where this is all going. Um, I think the energy consumption estimates seem to be kind of in that kind of hundred ish terawatt hours, and it's it's closely linked to price. So uh, you know uh, you know as as prices increase very rapidly, so has uh, energy consumption. I wrote a commentary a couple of years ago. Uh, back then, I think Bitcoin price was I don't know four or five thousand uh, dollars, uh, and energy consumption was in the forty to fifty terawatt hour range. Uh, so now, you know, that's um, increased very quickly uh, in a couple of years. So, yeah, I mean, five ten years ago, you know, this was zero, or ten years ago, this was a, a zero uh, electricity consumption. It's now um, you know point six point seven percent of global electricity use. So it's it's uh, you know it's something we need to pay attention to, and I think policymakers should be paying attention to this um, because it's it is a rapidly growing source, and we need to make a determination of you know again whether it's worth it. I guess. All right. Now that I've got both of your thoughts on the hot Twitter debate, we'll move to the audience questions. So the first question is: Increasing use of technology can also reduce carbon emissions, with examples such as ride sharing and hail and ride buses reducing travel emissions per person. Working from home, as you both mentioned, can also reduce emissions as there's no need to commute. Are these factors included in estimates of digital energy footprints? Um, so in terms of di the direct footprint, um, yeah, so the, the energy use from, you know, those, you know, these kind of data traffic from video conferencing uh, are all, all included, but, um, what often is not included when we talk about, you know, is, is ICT responsible for X percent of global emissions? We're not talking about the uh, effects on these other sectors. So we aren't talking about uh, reduced emissions in transportation or buildings, or in some, some cases, increased emissions uh, from, from transportation, right? So, you know, ride hailing is, is an interesting example because, um, uh, you know, there's, you know, if, if, the, sh if the ride is shared, uh, potentially that could reduce emissions. But if the ride is not shared uh, and it's displacing, uh, you know, public transit or otherwise a mode you might have, you know, walked or, or cycled, that is actually leading to a net increase in emissions. So, you know, at the systems level, that's a very complicated thing to think about because, you know, the car ownership decisions might actually be impacted by the availability of that service. Um, so we get into very difficult conversations around what is a you know the base scenario what we're you know trying to measure reductions or increases off of. Um, but in general, I think a lot of the discussions around digital are very narrowly focused. So they focus either just on the footprint or just on the enabling potential, and they're they're not as kind of comprehensive, which kind of misses the the point of you know whether it's having positive or negative imp impacts. Yeah, just to just to add to that, I think that um, I mean I think it's absolutely right. I, th I think I mean it whether or not those that that those kind of third order effects or the outside sort of benefits of of information technology, whether that's included in the estimate depends on the study and who's doing the estimate and where they've drawn the the boundary. I mean, the predicting the those those kind of outside or third order effects is really really hard because you it depends on kind of. You know what uh, what what else people do in their day and what other technologies are available and public transport and you know like there's there's so many uh different dependencies that that, that kind of analysis is, is quite hard usually people stop there with their boundaries often a lot of studies do i think um i mean i think 
Um, there are certain sectors um, or certain applications, um, as highlighted by the by, by the question, that that do start, stand to benefit. Sort of transportation is one of them, um, and I would add to that um, sort of heating and cooling. There's there's lots of uh, things you can kind of do at you know at almost at the thermostat level, um, uh, and there are there are smart thermostats out there. Um, it's it's still it's still unclear whether they're saving us that much energy, but but they have the potential to to really do that. I think one of the problems with with um, sort of these uh, I guess these gadgets in general is that they rather than they might save energy or that might be a touted potential benefit, but often their digital technologies are used to raise the fidelity or the quality or the convenience of a service. Um, so I guess one example might be um, you know like you, if you install smart light bulbs. The idea is that you might want to create kind of mood lighting, or you might want to have sort of an you know an auto setting so it's the lights are on when you arrive home, so it's, it feels cozy. And but actually, that that ends up maybe consuming more. And then you've also got the standby power of network lights because each one's consuming three to five watts all the time. So, which might be more than the than, than the light bulb itself in some cases. Um, so, I mean, I guess another example might be like robot vacuum cleaners. Um, so they seem small, they're battery powered and stuff like that. But, you know, compared to a conventional vacuum that you might run once a week, a robot vacuum cleaner might run five or seven days a week if you let it. Um, and then you're actually not, not saving that much. The idea is that the floor is cleaner or you don't have to do anything about it. And then that's the benefit of the gadget, not energy savings as it, as it could be potentially. So, so I think it's, it's good to kind of watch out, to kind of keep an eye on these, these tricky devices because they'll, they'll seem like they're saving energy, but then actually it, it could lead to, to, to a rise in, in some cases. And that's happened with, with smart thermostats in fact. So not, not across the board, I should say, but, but um, there's certain, certain use cases uh, have shown that, that it, can, it can increase. Yeah, boundary drawing for these things is always such a thorny problem. The next question is, is it possible to track your own personal energy usage from data servers? Uh, not that I'm aware of, um, but it, it, yeah, I think in general, uh, it's gonna be the, the, you know, a very small part of your own personal carbon footprint. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, the biggest, you know, in terms of your digital uh, carbon footprint, most of it's probably coming from your device. So whether you're watching TV or you know using your laptop, most of the energy consumption is going to be coming from there. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. There are kind of these you know calculators online, but they are using you know like I mentioned uh, these older estimates that uh, assumptions that you know greatly overstate the energy or carbon emissions. Um, so I'd be kind of cautious of those. But generally, it, it's it's going to be very small for most internet users, unless you're you know like a heavy cloud gamer or something with a huge um, computer with a several graphics cards. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, I think um, I tend to try to treat um, you know I think of digital devices and and services as it's almost like a light fixture. It's like if you if you're using it. And you're engaged with it, great, um, go for it. Um, but maybe maybe don't leave it on if you if you can avoid it, or if it's easy enough to 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 switch off, um, or to close the app, or you know that might be drawing data. That's kind of my my general approach with the, with the with the online services um, and 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 smaller devices. I think um, there's there's um, people there's kind of a a tendency to upgrade, and I think um, you know. The, that kind of that that manufacturing, those rare earth metals, the transportation to get the device to you, um, even even for really small devices like I think like the iPhone one, like the iPhone 10 or 10s is was roughly around a tenth of a transatlantic flight or something like that, which is not nothing um, actually. So so I kind of you know if you can eke that extra year out of your device or if you can use some other device in the same way, uh, that's that's uh, absolutely a, a good thing to do, I think. Generally, the more metal is in a device, the bigger a battery it has, uh, the higher resolution screen, then, 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 then the higher the higher the impact in general. So um, I think getting the most out of the devices that you have and putting off the upgrade uh, for a little bit longer is, is also a good thing. Okay. Our next question sort of brings us back to smart homes, as Mike mentioned before. The person asks, demand side response, such as switching appliances off when total 
energy demand exceeds the energy supply is currently being explored for the smart grid. With their large energy footprint and always on in the background nature, do you think digital devices could be used in this way? And I think the question is, could be used in this way to reduce the climate impact of a lot of our end uses? So I think it's it's possible for uh, for data centers. Um, I mean, Google's kind of published a white paper looking at this kind of uh, flexible compute load. So they're exploring whether you know some processing of uh, in their data centers could be shifted overnight. So kind of effectively acting as demand response uh, to absorb you know excess wind generation, for example. Um, I'm not sure about other um, kind of other data infrastructures. So like data transmission networks are basically on all the time. So um, I'm not sure how you would use those as demand response resources or, or devices for that matter, like a television, you want it to be on when you want it to be on. So uh, maybe the potential really is those shiftable appliances, like, you know, um, uh, whether it's heating or cooling, uh, your, your home washer, those kind of um, things that are, are flexible for time. Like you don't really care if it's on at you know, 5 a.m. or, uh, or 5 p.m. Uh, whereas I think you would care to, to, to watch your TV at the time you wanna watch, so. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm not sure this is exactly answering the question, but I think the, you know, the, the digital services tend to be, they are on demand. They are when people ostensibly want to use them primarily. Um, there was, there was, there has been some work and there still is, Quite a lot of interest in um, using um, electric vehicles, which are, I guess, a form of a smart device. Um, that they have they have varying levels of smartness, uh, but they're getting smarter and smarter um, as as kind of a reservoir to help balance the grid. So if you've got your electric vehicle plugged in and it's charged up, can you use that to buffer at times of high demand while while still staying charged up enough uh, to 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 get where you want to be? Uh, and so that's kind of kind of an interesting way because it's a bit like you know, sort of building batteries into the into the infrastructure of the fabric of the house. But actually, if you've got an electric vehicle, um, and the idea is to to electrify um, um, the the vehicle fleet, um, then can you just use that as kind of a, a reservoir for for power? And I guess a lot of there would be a lot of a lot of IT, a lot of algorithms involved in in balancing the grid that way, if that were a possibility. All right. Well, that's the last of our audience questions. So thank you both so much for joining us, Mike and George, and thank you to everyone at home watching. Um, just so everyone watching knows, the Oxford Climate Society has two upcoming events this week. On Thursday evening, we have a film screening of Woman at War with a discussion afterwards. And next Monday, we'll be joined by Professor Ademar Edenhofer to discuss the European Green Deal. You can find more about these events on our Facebook page or on our email newsletter. Thank you all for coming and I hope you have a great night.